different different lifestyle, way of life. Um, these men went out in these boats and were gone for years and years. And in any event, the book that Eric has written um, is Leviathan, the history of whaling in America, along with many others. He has many awards, and as he mentioned, he's from Marblehead, so a neighbor. <laughs> um, and with that. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for uh, inviting me and allowing me to participate in Rowley Reads. And uh, Nathaniel Philbrick's In the Heart of the Sea is, tells the amazing story of the whale ship Essex that was uh, struck by a sperm whale and then the torturous voyage of some of the crewmen and how they ultimately had to survive by resorting to cannibalism. But today I'm going to present the broader history of whaling in America, which I think is equally amazing and fascinating. This is John Smith's famous map of New England. He put it together in uh, 1616, after he came to America in 1614. What I didn't know before working on this book was that the main reason that John Smith came to America was to hunt for whales. He also came to look for gold and silver, as many of the discoverers of the day did. But uh, for centuries, whaling had been a major industry in Europe where whale oil was called Lumera and was used as an illuminant. So John Smith's backers hoped that he would come back to Europe, and England in particular, with a hold full of oil. Now, although Smith and his men saw many whales, they didn't harpoon a single one, and he left for England in July of 1614. But years later, in one of his journals, he wrote that if he and his men had killed some whales, he planned to stay in America with 10 of his men and establish a foothold for a colony. So the mind kind of reels to think what would have happened if John Smith had harpooned some whales. Plymouth Rock would have remained just that, a rock, instead of a touchstone for the origins of the country. Although Smith had no luck with whales, the early colonists did. Throughout much of the 1600s and the early 1700s, colonists up and down the coast participated in what was called shore whaling, which is, uh, and they would bring the whales back to process the oil and the baleen. Eventually, colonists became impatient waiting for whales to wash ashore. So by the mid-1600s, they began the nearshore whaling, which uh, they would take boats within a few miles of the beach. Lookouts on the beach would scan the horizon. If they saw a whale, they would yell out, whale off or whale in the bay, and the whalemen would come running and they would jump into their whale boat, usually six men to a whale boat, four of whom would likely have been Native Americans at this time, which were a very important labor source, and they would head out into deeper water. Once the men got to the whale, they would harpoon it, and then they would bring it back, row it back to shore. They would inspect the whale. They would cut off the slabs of blubber and bring them into the tri house and pitch them into the iron tri pots where they would melt out the whale oil. And they'd also cut out the baleen from the mouths of the whale. And uh, the baleen would be used for various fashion purposes, such as making stays for corsets or hoops in hoop skirts. Now, after hunting whales near shore for the better part of the century, the whales grew less numerous. So the next phase of whaling commenced, and that was offshore whaling. The legendary story has it that in 1712, whaling captain Christopher Hussey left N Nantucket's Harbor uh, going out to hunt for right whales, supposedly. He was followed by a couple of other whale boats. A storm blew in and sent him and his men about 20 to 30 miles away from Nantucket, where they fell in with a school of sperm whales. They harpooned one of them and towed it back to Nantucket. Thus, supposedly, the offshore whaling industry was born. But the only problem with this story is that Christopher Hussey at the time was six years old. Now, although Nantucket whalemen are you know, well known for their whaling prowess, a six-year-old would have been hard-pressed to have done the deed. But fortunately, an historian who has done some deep research found out at this very same time there were other huzzies, probably cousins, who were selling something called parmaceti, 
to local merchants, which is spermaceti oil. So starting around 1712, men would get into larger ships and they would range up and down the coast for a week, a month, up to a year at a time, hunting uh, humpback whales, right whales, and sperm whales. And this industry grew very large. On the eve of the American Revolution, there were roughly 150 whale ships, no, 360 whale ships, sorry, leaving from colonial ports. 150 of those came from Nantucket alone. A little bit more than 50% of all the income that the colonies earned from the mother country, or Old England, came from the sale of whale oil and baleen, and to a lesser extent, ambergris. Now, ambergris is this waxy material that came, was excreted by sperm whales, and somebody thousands of years ago discovered that if you shaved off a little bit of this ambergris and dissolved it in perfume, it made the fragrance last longer. And at this time, ambergris was literally worth its weight in gold. In Massachusetts, although many people felt that cod was king, whaling actually had a larger impact on the local economy. What you have here is a proverbial Nantucket sleigh ride. You can see the whale is tethered to this whale boat. The uh, boat steer is there with the hatchet raised aloft. He's getting ready to cut that line in case the whale towed the whale boat away from the mother ship, or worse, if the whale dove, it could bring that whale boat under the waves within a split second. And many boats were pulled in under, and a number of men were tangled up in the line and dragged to their deaths. The American Revolution had a devastating impact on, Americans whale, on America's whaling fleet. Whale ships were destroyed at port and at sea at an alarming rate. Nantucket, which had 150 whale ships at the outset of the Revolution, by the Revolution's end, had only 30 whale ships left. And the only place that tried to continue whaling during the American Revolution was Nantucket, but they didn't do a very good job. They had a really tough time. Now, does anybody know what this engraving is? Sort of a famous engraving from early American history? Boston, Boston Massacre, also called the Bloody Massacre at the time, and this was engraved by Paul Revere. And this engraving has a whaling connection because Crispus Attucks, a black man who was killed during the altercation, was actually a whaleman on a boat in the mid-1700s that uh, left out of Boston. Now, after the war, American merchants like William Roach here of Nantucket tried to rebound, but there were many obstacles, foremost of which was England. England had just been trounced by the upstart Americans, and England, unfortunately for the Americans, was the single largest market for whale oil and baleen. But the English didn't want anything to do with American whale oil and baleen. In fact, they wanted to build their own whaling industry, so they slapped an enormous tax on imported whale oil and baleen from America, and the American whaling industry literally dried up. Nantucketers decided that their allegiance lay with their business, not with their newly formed country, and many merchants from Nantucket emigrated and took their whale ships with them. They went to Canada, France, and England, and they sold their oil and baleen to England from those outposts, thereby avoiding the tax. But towards the end of the 1700s, things started to look up for the American whaling fleet. The economy was getting up off the ground. Lighthouses up and down the coast were being lit with sperm oil. And many cities were being lighted with whale oil lamps. And the late 1700s is also the first time that American whalemen went into the Pacific Ocean, which was literally teeming with millions of sperm whales, the most valuable whale of all to pursue. Now, just when things were looking up, another disaster befell the American whaling fleet, and that was the War of 1812. Once again, whale ships were destroyed at, dot, at port and at sea at an alarming rate, and Nantucket again tried to continue whaling, but they had only limited success. And while working on this book, I discovered that right before the end of the War of 1812, Nantucket seceded from the United States. They did so under duress from the British Navy, which basically said, if you don't secede and stop paying taxes 
to America, we are going to attack your whale ships and perhaps your island as well. So Nantucket acceded to this demand. But then five months later, after they made this decision, the Treaty of Ghent was signed, ending the war, and everybody conveniently forgot about Nantucket's traitorous ways. Now, there was one bright spot for American whalemen during the War of 1812, and it was provided by this man, Captain David Porter of the USS Essex, not to be confused with the whale ship Essex, which was sunk uh, later by a sperm whale. He was part of our minuscule Navy, and he was given instructions to go to the South Atlantic to engage with British warships. He went there. He found no warships. So he decided on a bold course of action, and he rounded Cape Horn and went into the Pacific Ocean, thereby becoming the first American warship ever to sail in the Pacific Ocean. Now that he was there, he needed a mission. On a layover in Valparaiso, Chile, he was talking to an American whaleman who told him that there were plenty of American whale ships around the Galapagos Islands that had no idea that the war had begun. But unfortunately for them, there were also numerous British whale ships in the region that not only knew that the war had begun, they had been given instructions by their government to attack American whale ships and take them as prizes. So hearing this, Porter decided to even the score, and he did a very good job. In the span of about a year, he captured 12 British whale ships, and in the process saved many American whale ships from being captured. But in the end, Porter's arrogance got the better of him. He wanted to inscribe his name in the history books, and he knew that you couldn't do that by attacking puny British whale ships. You need to come up against one of Her Majesty's <coughs> finest. So he went back to Valparaiso, Chile, and he engaged with two British warships and got the worst end of it. He lost and the USS Essex was sent back to England where it served as a prisoner ship for the remainder of the war. Now after the war, it was the beginning of the golden age of whaling, which lasted from the late 18 teens to the 1850s, the mid 1850s. Now, does anybody know who this is? Very famous person, wrote the most famous whaling book in history. Herman Melville. Herman Melville. This is Herman Melville in 1861, good looking man. And uh, reading about his history got me really depressed. And that's because when he wrote Moby Dick, he was also already a writer of some repute. And he thought that Moby Dick was gonna launch him to literary stardom. But it actually did the exact opposite. It started his slide towards obscurity. The book came out. It got miserable reviews. It sold abysmally. And when he died in 1891, Harper's Weekly gave him, a, him an obituary that was only one sentence long. So I vowed that when I die, the Marblehead Reporter better give me an obituary that's at least three paragraphs. Now, Melville wrote about the Golden Age, and it was a golden age, the golden age of whaling. Uh, in 1846, there were 735 American whale ships out of a total of 900 worldwide. Whaling was the fifth largest industry in the United States. And here in Massachusetts, it was the third largest industry after cotton manufacturing and the production of shoes. Seventy million dollars was invested in the whaling industry and 70,000 people earned their living working in it. In 1853, its most profitable year, American whaling fleet killed 8,000 whales, generating profits of more than 11 million dollars. You can see why New Bedford, which at this time had taken over the reins from Nantucket as the leading American whaling port, was also considered to be the richest city in the United States on a per capita basis. And all that money came from whaling. The golden age is when Nantucket handed over the reins as the nation's premier whaling port to New Bedford. It's when whalemen discovered more than 200 islands around the world. It's also when as many as 60 different cities and towns in the United States sent at least one or more whale ship out. And it's when women started to appear on whale ships. 
Most of them were the wives of captains, but there were a few women that dressed up as men and hid aboard whale ships. And these so-called hen frigates were seen throughout the ocean and supposedly added an air of domesticity to the otherwise rough whaling life. And that's the whaling captain's wives, not the, the, the women that dressed up as men. Now what I want to do now is go through quickly a series of slides that will show you what whaling was like during the Golden Age. This is the Concordia, outward bound on Buzzards Bay, and you can tell it's a whale ship by the whale boats hanging off the davits on the side and its boxy shape. Whale ships were designed for cargo stability and uh, cargo capacity, not for speed, although some of them did go rather fast. During the Golden Age, the average whaling voyage lasted four years. And in that span of time, a whaleman could expect, could expect to spend up to two months aloft on this platform, looking out towards the horizon, trying to spy whales. And when he saw a whale, he would yell, whale off, or there, there she blows, and the hunt would be on. The men would get into their whale boats and row rapidly to where they last saw the whale. This shows the boat steerer ready to thrust a harpoon into the flank of a sperm whale. And these harpoons were nothing like javelins. You couldn't pitch one 30 or 40 feet and expect it to do any damage, partly because it was very heavy, but mainly because whale blubber, unlike ours, is very thick and fibrous. So unless you're very close to the whale, and it's also very thick, in a sperm whale, it could be up to 14 inches thick. So unless you're very close and thrust the harpoon with a lot of force, the harpoon will not stick into the whale. But what they would try to do is get uh, wood to black skin right up on the whale, throw a harpoon if they had a chance, throw a second harpoon, and then the Nantucket sleigh ride would commence. This is the final stage of a whale hunt in the South Atlantic. That's a right whale. You can see the boat header with the lance there, he's thrusting that lance deep into the whale, hoping to get to the life of the, uh, the whale, which is a knot of blood vessels or the lungs, and success would show itself as a crimson gusher of blood coming out of the blowhole, which the whaleman would call tapping the claret or chimneys of fire. And then the whale would go into its final flurry, which was a very dangerous time for the whaleman in this whale boat. And then it would die. It was so-called, they used to call it fin out. And then they would tow the whale back to the mother ship. You can see one right there in the distance. And there's a whale waiting to be processed. And there's another whale that is in the process of being cut into. Whales didn't always get the worst of it. Sperm whales in particular were said to be dangerous at both ends because of their bulbous, battering ram of a head, their mighty tooth-studded jaw, and their flukes, tail flukes, which were said by whalemen to be the hand of God because if they came down on your whale boat, you were going to meet your maker. This is a small sperm whale being cut into. You can see the men on the cutting stage. You can see the cutting spades. They're cutting that blanket piece of blubber, which is being raised higher and higher, and then it will be cut lengthwise and brought on board for further processing. Now, while they cut into these whales, there would be plenty of sharks in the water milling around, and occasionally men would fall into the water, but they were rarely bitten by sharks because the sharks, what they really wanted was the whale's blubber. This is the head of a sperm whale being brought on board. Inside of this head is something called the spermaceti organ, which could have as much as 23 barrels of spermaceti oil, which is the finest of all whale oils. It was used to make spermaceti candles, which people read by, including Benjamin Franklin. This is the jaw of a sperm whale being brought on board. They would wrench the teeth free and put them aside, and later when they had some downtime, they would engage in scrimshaw. These are the mincers. They're cutting the horse pieces of blubber into so-called Bible leaves, and the reason that they do that is to increase the surface area of the blubber so that when it's pitched into the tripods, it melts more quickly. Baleen whales were, not, were desired not only for the copious amounts of oil that they could produce, but also for the baleen hanging in their mouths. 
This is the upper jaw of a bowhead whale, and uh, it had the longest baleen of all, up to 14 feet long. And baleen had a very unique characteristic. When you heat it up, you can bend it, and then when it cools down, it would retain the shape that it had been given. That's why it was so useful for making hoops and hoop skirts and stays in corsets. These are the triworks on board a whale ship. What the men would do, you can see the fires below and the iron tripods above. The men would pitch the blubber into those tripods. The oil would melt out of the blubber. It'd be siphoned off into these casks. And anything that was left over, the skin, the integument, would rise to the top of this boiling oil. And it was called cracklins. And it would be scooped off and fed into the fire below to continue the flames. But also, whalemen used to eat this stuff called cracklins. It was sort of like an early American version of pork rinds. And one of the talks I gave, a Norwegian man was in the audience, and when he was very young, he was on a whaling ship, and he said that he ate cracklins, and he said it tasted pretty good, but I can't vouch for that. This is the whale ship Wanderer trying out at night, presenting a ghostly scene, and you can get, get an understanding of why it was said that whale ships could be smelled before they were seen. The smell of burning whale flesh is a very pungent odor. Now these are the docks in New Bedford in 1871. This is already a time when the whaling fleet was in decline, and this gives you an idea of how large the whaling industry was. Each one of those casks holds hundreds of gallons of whale oil, which is waiting to be distributed domestically and internationally. These are whale oil lamps from the early 1800s that have since been electrified. Whale oil, believe it or not, was an ingredient in soap. It was also used to lubricate the gears of the Industrial Revolution, both large gears and small gears. And this image gives you another idea of how large this industry had begun. These are the docks in San Francisco in the early 1870s. And that forest is a forest of baleen from bowhead whales that's drying in the sun. And in the background, you can see two whale ships. Gives you an idea of how large the whale ships by this time had become. And some of them were even steam powered. Here's an ad for corsets. Uh, baleen was called whalebone in the trade. And the corset stay would give the women that unnatural hourglass uh, shape. And the finest corsets, of course, were made with baleen. This is a beautiful example of Scrimshaw, uh, a man either remembering a scene of domestic bliss that he had left behind, or more likely imagining a scene that he would like to experience in the future. Scrimshaw, as you might know, is incredibly valuable. Uh, every time I write a book I, after I finish it, I try to buy something that reminds me of the book, and I was very naive when I started writing this book. I thought, well, maybe I'll buy a piece of Scrimshaw, and then I discovered how expensive it was. A piece recently sold for over $300,000, so suffice it to say I do not own a piece of Scrimshaw. I bought a carved sperm whale, which now hang, hangs over the front door of our house. Now, the golden age of American whaling came to an end in the late 1850s. That's when whale oil was being rocked by the competition. There was kerosene derived from coal. There was lard oil that came from hogs, which appropriately enough were called prairie whales. And there was camphene, which was the distillate of turpentine and alcohol, which had the unfortunate byproduct or habit of exploding on occasion. But whale oil took its most serious blow in 1859 when Colonel Edwin Drake drilled a well into the countryside of Titusville, Pennsylvania, and struck oil. Literally overnight, the whale oil industry was relegated to almost a footnote. And it was a double blow, because not only was kerosene, which, could be, which was produced from petroleum, a cheap and plentiful source of illumination, but also petroleum byproducts could be used for lubrication, replacing whale oil for lubricating purposes. Now this cartoon, from Vanity Fair in 1861 shows the whales celebrating the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania. And in the background, there are banners which give clues uh, 
as to why they were so merry. One proclaims, oil's well that ends well. And another one says, we wail no more for our blubber. And it was true, it was a pretty good time for many whales, but the whaling industry was far from over. During the Civil War, the whaling fleet contracted by 50%. The Union Navy had an idea. It thought it could strangle the Confederacy if it could just block up their main ports. So the Union Navy purchased 45 whale ship, 45 ships, 38 of which were whale ships, and they filled them with stones. And this infamous stone fleet sailed south and was sunk across the mouth of Charleston, South Carolina's harbor. This is a cover of Harper's Weekly, and it shows part of the uh, stone fleet being sunk. The stone fleet, however, was a complete failure. The heavily laden ships sank deep into the mud. Currents gouged out new paths for commerce coming in and out of the harbor, and marine boring worms made quick work of the wooden planking of the ships. And after a year's time, there was almost no evidence that this mighty armada, this stone fleet, had been sunk in the mouth of the harbor. Now, the Confederate Navy also wanted to sink northern whale ships, but not in the manner of the stone fleet. Their idea was to send out raiders to attack northern commerce, and their number one target was whale ships. They hoped they could cripple the northern economy. Two of the raiders that were sent out, the Alabama and the Shenandoah, sank or burned 40 Union whale ships. The Shenandoah was captained by James Waddell, shown here. And Waddell claims, gets his claim to fame by having burned 24 whale ships in the northern reaches of the Pacific and the Arctic Ocean after Grant received the surrender of Lee at Appomattox. So the war was essentially over. What happened is he would attack a whale ship. He'd talk to the people on board that whale ship. They would tell him that the war was over, that uh, Lee had surrendered to Grant, but he didn't believe these duplicitous Union whalemen, so he kept burning the ships until he ran across a British trading ship that said, yeah, you know, the war is over. And so Waddell tucked tail. He took the Shenandoah all the way back to England, stayed there for 10 years, then returned to America and ended his life as an oyster warden in the Chesapeake Bay. Sort of a strange end for a very interesting life. Now, the 1870s were a disastrous time for the American whaling fleet. In 1871, there was a single worst disaster in the history of that fleet. 33 whale ships in the Arctic Ocean gambled that the ice would stay off a little bit longer, but they lost their gamble. They were hunting for bowhead whales, and the ice came in and crushed all of them. What's amazing is that the 1,219 people on board those ships were able to drag and sail a mini armada of whale boats 70 miles over ice and through narrow passageways of water to the open ocean where other whale ships were waiting to take them back to San Francisco and Honolulu. Five years later, there was another Arctic disaster. 12 whale ships were crushed and 47 men lost their lives. This is the Charles W. Morgan up on the rails in the early 1900s. The whaling industry wound down towards the end of the 1800s and early 1900s. A lot of whale ships were left at the docks to rot. Some were broken up for kindling. Many whale ships got into transporting guano or bird waste to America, which was used as fertilizer by farmers. And in fact, there was a very large guano fertilizer plant in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. But there was one bright spot during this waning period, and it was provided by fashion. Corsets came back into style with a vengeance in the 1870s and 1880s, and of course the best corsets used baleen stays. So all of a sudden, men who had given up on whaling got back in their whale ships and headed to the Arctic Ocean, where bowhead whales were still relatively plentiful, and they had the longest baleen of all in their mouths. At one time, baleen was selling for $5.80 a pound. Four voyages came back in 1898 and earned a combined total of $750,000, which is a large amount of money today. It was a, 
fortune back then. But then things turned in the other direction just as quickly. In 1907, a French designer named Paul Perret decided that women shouldn't look like an hourglass. They should have a slim profile. And as a result, the market for corsets dried up and with it, the market for baleen. During World War I, as the country experienced shortages of all kinds, there was a brief rally in the whale oil market, and for the first time, Americans started eating whale meat in limited amounts because, instead of beef and mutton, because most of that was being sent overseas to feed the troops. But by the end of the war, and shortly thereafter, there were only a few Yankee whale ships left, and many of them were making more money as props in silent movies than they were whaling. This is a still picture from the silent movie Down to the Sea in Ships, which came out in 1922, and it starred Clara Bow, the it girl of the day. It's a love story set against the background of the golden age of whaling, and the Charles W. Morgan plays a feature role in the movie. This picture is actually the forecastle. It was taken in the forecastle of the Charles W. Morgan, and the star of the movie is over to the far right-hand side. And I don't know if you've seen any silent movies lately, but if you have a chance to see this movie, it's worth seeing. It's, it's, it's fun. It's a little dated, obviously, but it's fun to watch. Now, this picture was taken on August 26, 1924. Two days before this shot, it was a much more nostalgic scene on the docks of New Bedford. The Wanderer, which is pictured here, was ready to go out on a whaling voyage in the mid-Atlantic looking for sperm whales. And everybody thought that it was going to be the last of the Yankee whale ships to ever go to sea. So hundreds of people and numerous reporters came to the docks of New Bedford to witness this passing of a time capsule for a once great industry. The Wanderer moored in Buzzards Bay that evening and a nor'easter swept in and sent the ship scudding across the bay, dragging two anchors, until it rammed into Cuttyhunk Island. And the image here are sightseers basically coming to see the ship on the rocks of Cuttyhunk Island. Now it's ironic that the wander, in the end, didn't wander very far, but it does provide a fitting final image to the great era of American whaling. And my talk's almost over, but not quite. I figured I'd show a few images. This is a humpback whale breaching off the coast of Alaska. And I had a funny uh, story uh, years ago when this book came out in 2007, I gave a talk to a bunch of second graders in Marblehead. And I told them, this is a picture of a humpback off of Cape Cod. And there was silence for a couple of seconds. And one of the kids said, that's not Cape Cod. It doesn't have mountains like that. I said, you're right. And then later on in this talk, these sharp kids, one of them asked me, how long did it take you to write this book? And I said, oh, about two years. And at the time when I wrote this book, I had a full-time job. Now I'm writing full-time. but So I was very tired for those two years. And he goes, you know, I wrote a book too. I said, oh, that's great. And he said, it only took me a minute. <laughs> so I'm glad he wasn't my competition. Sort of like, what is that, Art Link letter, I think, from the mouths of kids. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, this is a young albino sperm whale. And if you're a close reader of Moby Dick, you realize that Moby Dick was not actually a completely white whale or an albino. He was just white enough to have gained that appellation, and he actually had a mottled hue. This image is just amazing. It was taken by a photographer, Flip Nicklin. Just look at the mother there. The strength of that animal is just amazing. I always think, you know, since you're reading In the Heart of the Sea, which is about a whale ramming a whale ship, that happened four times in the history of American whaling as far as is known, with the Essex being the most famous incident. But I often thought that if whales just had figured out that if they ran these ships, they could sort of get rid of these people that are killing them, it would have changed the whole history of American whaling. Because there were millions of sperm whales, and there were probably thousands of bull male sperm whales who were 70 to 80 feet long, certainly big enough to sink a whale ship, but very few whales ever turned around 
and rammed their tormentors. And these are the flukes of a sperm whale uh, getting ready to go down on one of their deep dives, perhaps in pursuit of their main prey, which were giant squid. And with that, I'm just about done with the talk. I just wanted to show you, I've, the uh, Leviathan is one of 11 books that I've written. I just finished another book, which is going to come out not this April, next April, on the history of lighthouses in America. A fascinating book. But these are two of my last books. One is Fur, Fortune, and Empire, the Epic History of the Fur Trade in America. And the other one was called When America First Met China, which is an exotic history of tea, drugs, and money in the age of sale. And part of the reason that I wrote that is I live next to Salem. I was actually married in the Peabody Essex Museum. And as you know, the China trade has a very deep history here in the North Shore. So with that, I'm done. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And I also brought copies of books if anybody's interested in purchasing one. So thanks again for coming. How many... Uh... Oh, oh. <laughs> That's okay. You're going to have to... Okay. <laughs> okay, so my question is, the, the terminology you use, like industry and processing, was there any sort of outlook of these are creatures that you're butchering? I mean, was it really just all about the economy of it? Yes, that question I get a lot. You have to put yourself in the context of the time. You can't evaluate the whaling industry of that era by the morals and ethics and perspectives of the modern day. You can look at modern day whaling and do that, but back then, Virtually nobody was concerned about whales as an animal and that we were pushing them towards extinction. The only concern was that if you made these whales go extinct or there were too few of them, your industry would be crippled and you'd be losing your ability to make money. There were a few exceptions to that. There was a writer who wrote a letter, a great letter, to the uh, Hawaiian publication, The Friend, and he signed it, the polar whale. And he basically, this is an impassioned letter in which he says, you whalemen are destroying all my relatives, the bowhead whales in the Arctic Ocean. And couldn't you leave us alone? Because if you keep going down this path, we're gonna be extinct. There were a few examples of that, but essentially, Virtually nobody until the early 1900s when the conservation movement got off the ground was thinking about these whales as anything else but potential profit centers. Commodity. Yeah, a commodity. Just like the fur trade was the same. Uh, I mean, the American history, not just American history, world history is written on the backs of the commodification of nature. So many great industries are based on extraction or killing some other organism. And certainly before the 1900s, it was rare for somebody to have what you would consider to be a conservation ethic or a concern about another sentient being that would be anything like the concern that they might have for humans. So. How would they uh, light their homes? Yeah, well, the oil, it depends on the reservoir, how long the uh, flame would last. You've probably seen a number of old whale oil lamps. Some have big reservoirs, smaller reservoirs. I couldn't give you a, a time per ounce, but they would, they would have them on at night. It would give a relatively good light, depending on the quality of the oil, and it would basically allow people to extend the length of day. Before that, you, you, know, you go to sleep as in the, when the, the sun went down. This sort of extended the day and helped increase uh, uh, people's ability to work. Uh, there were spermaceti candles, which were the finest burning of all candles, much better light than tallow candles, which were made from animal fat. Uh, they were very expensive spermaceti candles, but apparently they threw off a very nice light. And no smoke. And no smoke, yeah. Very limited. I read the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, every once in a while I go to an antique shop or an old uh, show, an antique show. Uh, sometimes I've seen it at uh, what's that, Brimfield out in western Massachusetts. People will sell old vials of 
spermaceti oil, and occasionally you might find a spermaceti candle. Uh, but uh, if you have a chance, go to the New Bedford Whaling Museum or the Nantucket Whaling Museum if you're interested in this industry. Wonderful museums to visit and really amazing exhibits. And the last time I was at New Bedford was when I was a boy. The museum probably, I don't know if it was there back then, but it's a great museum to visit. Rarely. Uh, what they would do is those tripods, they would basically make a brick enclosure on the main deck because they were concerned about fires. But they were, very, they were enclosed in bricks and iron on the outside. So unless they were very, um, not, not lazy, but they, they weren't paying attention, uh, they would keep sparks or any flame from hitting the deck itself or anything wood. But uh, there were occasional fires that I uh, have heard about, but it was very rare. Would they eat the, the whale too? Yeah, the, the whalemen rarely, Americans never really got into whale meat. In Europe, uh, whale meat was a major commodity, just like whale oil. And in fact, tongues, whale tongue was considered a great delicacy, not only eaten straight, but also used in soup. And it was often reserved for the king and the clergy, because it was such a delicacy. When whaling came to America, uh, just like uh, the colonists looked down their nose at lobsters, which grew to be 20 pounds and could be picked out of the, the surf, uh, they also never ate whale meat, which is strange because they were in need of protein in the early years, but they didn't like the taste or they didn't bring it over from Europe. And it wasn't until World War I when there were shortages of all kinds that the federal government got into the business of trying to get people interested in eating some of this whale meat, which had always been going to waste and had just been set adrift. And they did sell a fair amount of whale meat, particularly in California, but it never caught on nationwide. As you know, they still eat whale meat in Japan, but even that is fading out rapidly because kids don't want to eat whale meat. They'd rather have a Big Mac or something else. Uh, I've, I don't know what whale meat would taste like made as a steak. I've heard people say it tastes a little like beef. Sometimes they said it's good. I had whale meat once, uh, but it was, it was sautéed in something. To me, it tasted like beef. Well, thanks again.